Well, I think Kate managed to put at least 12 pounds into that five pound bag. <laughs> So we've got to give her credit for that. Um, without further ado, so that we can uh, keep you all on your tight schedule today, I'm going to bring up Karen, who writes for the Detroit News. She is also a National Health Journalism Fellow at U USC, and you're going to hear a lot about the project that she did in terms of premature births and violence, um, really killing uh, children in Detroit in, in record numbers. And I have to say, Karen's a gal after my own, own, own heart, because she went from PR to journalism. Karen. Thank you for having me here. I, I hope you'll find my presentation informative and um, also helpful. Uh, and I want to make sure I can figure out how to use this. Um, my, my project uh, was on surviving through age 18 in Detroit. And the way that I came upon this topic was I just really felt that there's an awful lot in the news about what's happening with Detroit's economy, but oftentimes the news is really dominated by numbers um, and talk about the unemployment and the statistics and, you know, the businesses going to different countries and uh, the loss of jobs, but I think that there isn't enough coverage of what's happening with Detroiters. You know, what, what had been the result of all of this um, economic um, decline on individuals. And um, like Kate mentioned, I think that it's really important to tell the story sometimes through children, because in the state of Michigan, I think sometimes the city of Detroit is considered almost like an island. Uh, that it's really different and set apart than the rest of the state. And sometimes it's really hard to get lawmakers to care about people in the city of Detroit. But you have to care about kids. If you think that kids are suffering, you can't blame the kids for, for what they're going through. So I really wanted to focus on kids. Okay. Um, I What I did was I collected data from health from state health departments all across the country on the number of deaths of children age 18 and younger. And this was kind of a challenge because usually um, states, um, states and city health departments, they don't even consider 18-year-olds a child. And so I, I had to find um, population data broken out by single years of age in order to calculate death rates. So it was really kind of challenging. But I thought it was important because as a mother myself, I know that I wanted to get my kids through high school safe. I felt that I wanted to at least see them get to their 18th birthday so that they would be in good shape when they went on for the rest of their life in, in adulthood. And even though a lot of children in the city of Detroit don't graduate from high school, I thought I wanted to give them a fair shake of you know, let's see what happens to these kids and, and how much harder it might be for them to reach the age of 18 um, and go on to college or whatever um, because of the health risks that are faced in the city of Detroit. Um, I collected data on all the causes of death in the city of Detroit, um, from asthma to flu, um, and what I found out was that the second high, high, after infant mortality, which is Detroit has the highest infant mortality rate in the nation. After infant mortality, um, the largest number of deaths in Detroit were caused by homicide. So I decided that I would um, also collect data from those cities that I was looking at across the nation on, on homicide and collected um, rates of death from homicide. Um, so the second day of my series in January was focused on deaths from homicide and the effects of um, growing up in this culture of violence in Detroit. I didn't just look at the murders, I looked at the effects on um, the siblings and the rest of the family. And I had a whole story devoted on the in, on inside pages devoted to um, the effects of stress, um, the lifelong impacts of, on children who grow up in really stressful environments. On the second day of my series, Detroit Mayor uh, Mike Duggan called me and said that he finally wanted to talk. I had asked for comments from the mayor's office when I started my series, and he did not comment for my project. Neither did the chief of police in the city of Detroit. 
Health isn't really necessarily considered top topic in Detroit. I mean, there's a lot of coverage of the auto industry. There was a lot of media focus on uh, the declining economy, but health really wasn't at the top of the list in terms of beats. Um, but this story and the fact that our entire front page of the Detroit News on day one of the series was devoted to um, the results of my research got their attention. Um, what I found was that I was able to draw a direct connection between the economic decline in Detroit and the health of children. Um, actually, I wanted to... I'll have to get back to that. And actually, I think a little later I've got some graphics to show you. But um, basically, what I found was that um, rates, total rates of death and rates of death from homicide both increased during the recession in 2008 and 9 and 10. And also, the incidence of child abuse also increased as a re during the time that the economy was um, at its worst. Um, I faced a lot of obstacles. Um, inside the newsroom, um, you know, we do have a very small staff. We have a much smaller number of editors. And um, even when I got the fellowship, when the fellowship was offered to me, the managing editor didn't, wasn't sure if he wanted to let me do the project. Um, finally, he agreed to allow me to do the project as long as it didn't interfere with my daily work. So I ended up working for months at, after work and on weekends trying to compile my research and sneak in phone calls. Um, as a result of the fellowship, though, I was able to really, if it hadn't been for the fellowship, I, don't, I think he would have not let me take on the project at all. But the fact that I was able to say this is a fellowship opportunity, the University of Southern California, Annenberg School of Journalism, thinks this is a good story idea, that really, gave, that really made them think, well, you know, maybe we should let her do this. Um, so it added credibility to what, you know, I was, was trying to do. And um, I already talked about some of the skepticism I got from the, you know, in the outside world with the mayor and the chief of police not even wanting to comment for my story. So I had a lot to overcome. Um, other things that really helped from the National Health Journalism Fellowship were mentorship. I was able to talk over my story idea before I even made my proposal for the fellowship program. I, I originally started wanting to just work, about, work on the infant mortality issue because I knew that Detroit had the highest infant mortality rate in the nation. But with help from the people that I was able to talk to, they suggested that maybe it wasn't too big to look at all children and what was happening with their death rate. So that's what I did. Then I went out to um, University of Southern California for a week of intensive health training. You have to understand that I wasn't a health reporter until a year and a half ago. I used to cover the state legislature and the governor's office. I was all about politics. I knew nothing about health. So when I went, and that happens often in newsrooms, we're not all, you know, have the luxury of spending the entire, our entire career on one beat. So when I went out to USC, I heard terms like um, um, health disparity and um, <laughs> the importance of place and all these concepts that you're probably really familiar with as public health professionals that I had never heard before. So after hearing about these public health concepts, I had a better idea of what to look for in my reporting and how to frame my story. Um, I also got help with identifying sources. I was able to um, get names of people who were experts in different, you know, parts of my topic, such as stress on children. Um, and I um, was able to kind of start rethinking my role as a journalist. Um, I started realizing that I could call people from Harvard if they were the best source. I didn't have to just stick to sources from the University of Michigan. Um, that it, I realized that this wasn't just a local story, that there was national, that there was national uh, significance to the story I was trying to tell about Detroit. My goals were to quantify and compare. I knew that if I didn't have data to back up um, my story, that nobody would pay attention to it. I had the strong suspicion that Detroit probably had the worst child death rate in the nation, but I wasn't sure. Um, to find that out, I had to compare it to other cities. I also identified components of the problem. Um, I looked at 
in, in the as far as infant mortality, um, I felt that it was very important to explain to people why there's high infant mortality rate in Detroit. Why is it hard for women to seek prenatal care? They don't have transportation oftentimes. There's food deserts. It's difficult to get nutrition. Often they don't have support networks. Um, and as far as the, the violence problem, um, it was important to talk about this not just as a law enforcement issue. This was a health issue. Um, and I wanted to put a, a human face on the tragedy because I knew that nobody would care about what I was talking about if they couldn't identify with someone. So I talked to lots of mothers and, and um, siblings and children. Um, I agree with Kate. In fact, I think I had gotten my inspiration um, on highlighting solutions from hearing her at a previous fellowship um, workshop that I went to. Um, I knew that if the story was all negative, that it would just overwhelm people. They would feel hopeless, like they couldn't do anything at all. And so I looked for programs that were being effective at turning things around in Detroit. What I discovered was that there are tons of people working in Detroit, lots of foundations, millions and millions of dollars being poured into Detroit to try to change these things, from the Skillman Foundation, which funds um, big efforts to you know, strengthen neighborhood watch groups, to the Kellogg Foundation, which is working on nutrition programs. Uh, there's all kinds of programs. So I talked about those and which ones seemed to work. One that was really interesting was the mobile health clinics that are um, funded by the Children's Health Fund based in New York. They're sending um, mobile health clinics to Detroit public schools so that they can treat the 20,000 children with asthma in the city of Detroit. Um, as a result of um, talking, you know, with, with real people, um, I, I was able to, I think, engage the community by my stories, but I'm also working to continue that engagement um, by continuing my series. Since my initial special report, I've done stories on um, the high abortion rate in Detroit. Um, one third of pregnancies in Detroit are terminated, and this is due mostly for many of the same reasons that result in the high infant mortality rate. Um, there's a lot of poverty in the city of Detroit. There's also been cutbacks in funding for um, birth control. Um, and on October 8th, we're going to host the Detroit News and the Kellogg Foundation are going to host a community engagement event, um, a panel discussion of local um, people that are working on infant mortality pro programs. And then this will be followed by a lunch funded by the California Endowment National Health Journalism Program, to which we'll, we've invited the mayor, the police chief, and some of the leaders of the foundations, neighborhood watch groups, and also some of the mothers and real people who have been impacted by these problems in the city of Detroit. So I think I've already gone over this. Detroit had, had the highest um, child death rate higher than any city it starts or larger in the United States. I also looked at a lot of smaller cities, and Detroit had a higher um, death rate than any of the cities that I looked at. These are some of the results that I found. You can see um, Detroit's uh, death rate was 120 per 100,000. Um, and um, San Jose, compared to San Jose, which was, we had a child death rate of 28. The highest number of deaths um, was, the, actually the highest death rate was in New Orleans, followed by Compton and Oakland, California. Detroit was fourth, but because of the extremely high number of, of um, infant deaths in Detroit, that push, pushed us to the top in terms of the number of, um, the rate of child deaths. Um, this was one of the people um, that I focused on in my story. She was very representative of a typical mother in the city of Detroit. She was young, uneducated, single mother, and um, she really, um, I was able to tell the story through, through her in, in um, kind of a big way. Um, this is Darnella. Um, I talked about her in a story that I wrote about the infant mortality program. Um, in Detroit. Um, I, I talked about her because she represents a lot of the problems that the, pro the projects that are working in Detroit have to help people work through. She's had her children taken away because she was living with someone who um, was beating her up 
and now she's pregnant with another child. She's working very, very hard to get her children back. Um, so I was making the point that it isn't really simple. It's not just getting them prenatal care. There's a lot of other issues that um, these women have to receive help with. Um, and so anyway, that was a, one, of, one of my sources. I also talked about the perinatal research branch of the Institutes of Health, which is located at the Detroit Medical Center, and some of the research that they've done there. Um, they've um, discovered a low-cost way of treating women for short, cer uh, short cervix, which is um, something that leads to um, preterm delivery, as I'm sure you're aware, and um, is more prevalent in African-American women. Um, in a research study that Dr. Sonia Hastan did, um, she found that there was a, a higher um, percentage of uh, women in Detroit with short cervix than in any other city that she that she um, studied. Um, this was a family that I used um, to talk about stress and the impact on um, families. Uh, this beautiful family lost their father, who was kind of a community hero. He was shot while he was on the job as a um, security guard. And the children talked about the fear that they experienced living in the city of Detroit, how they're afraid to go out to the park across the street from their house. And um, they're, the older girl who can drive is afraid to drive in her car to go to school or go anywhere else. And um, I also included a lot of the science in that story about stress. And, I was fortunate enough to have some scientists explain to me um, what a telomere is and, you know, why it's a bad thing if it gets shorter. So anyway, um, that's the kind of help that I think that, that you can give us in our reporting is trying to simplify some of these scientific things into plain language so that we can understand and explain it to our readers. This, these are pictures of the mobile health clinics visiting Detroit. Um, and this just, in case you're interested, is um, what happened to the infant mortality rate. You can see it started going down, then it went back up at the start of the recession and was high again and then started to go back down during 2011. Um, same thing with violent um, deaths spiked in 2008. And you can see that child abuse um, started decreasing, but then went back up. Uh, there's a missing year because the Michigan Department of Community Health switched their data collection system and lost the results. <laughs> Tell me that they don't know what happened in 2008. Um, and then this is one of my continuing stories. Um, I, I've continued with stories about the abortion rate in Detroit. Um, I did another story on maternal deaths. Detroit has a very, very high maternal death rate, again, for many of the same reasons um, that there's a high rate of preterm deliveries and infant mortality. And right now I'm working on a story about asthma. So um, I will be showing a short video um, after lunch, or I guess, yeah, I think after lunch um, on the Jackson family if anybody's interested. Thank you for having me. Karen, thank you. Um, because sitting is the new smoking, we're going to let you all get up and uh, stretch your legs for maybe 10 minutes. So if you can be back here by about 5 after, um, there's going to be a chance to ask some questions of this group, and we'd really like to hear some of your observations as well. Thanks.